podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To What's up, everybody? We are finally back with Smart People Podcast. This is Chris. And this is John. I know we've been out a little while, a couple weeks, but no harm, no foul. We had a hurricane to deal with and life somewhere in between there. But we are fresh off an awesome interview. Don't you think it was a good one? John, you look pained over there. Uh, I was just scratching my head. No, it was a fantastic interview. Who doesn't like talking about man's best friend? That's it. You guessed it. Tickle me Elmo. No, it's not. Oh, okay. No. We talked about dogs today, and it is awesome. If you are an animal lover, specifically dog owner, you will get a kick out of this. I think, I mean, you asked the awesome question about Tucker and his licking, and he instantly, boom, I know the answer to this. It's kind of funny because he's like, oh, yeah, you can you can train this very easily. And I was <laughs> like, God, I've been trying to do it for three years. He drops all types of interesting tidbits, and we'll get into a little bit more here in a second, but... We got big news. I mean, you might have seen it all over our Facebook pages, all over, you know, the email I sent out last night, but Smart People Podcast is a finalist in the podcast awards. Tell them what we've won, Roach. I guess we could put a gong. Well, we haven't won anything, (laughs) but we were nominated for Best Education Podcast at the Podcast Awards, and you can find everybody that's nominated over at podcastawards.com. I think this is the eighth year that it's been run. This year, it's going to be at the conference that used to be called Blog World, and now I forget what it's called, but it's a bunch of really cool, techie, nerdy people that go out to Las Vegas and talk about blogging and podcasting and internet videos. They don't care about what it is. These people love it. What you care about is sending us to Vegas. It's the People's Choice Podcast Awards. Right, but they won't actually be sending us to Vegas, because here's the funny part. If we win... We have to buy our ticket. We have to fly out there and and buy a hotel and pay for all that stuff. But if we win, we will go. We're going. We're going. And it's like my mom said today, Chris, it's a good thing for the resume. And I was like, really? That's I'm Yeah. Like, I mean, I guess the, Perfect. Po- the podcast resume... Anyway, so here's what you do. Go to podcastawards.com. Vote for us under the education section. It's going to ask you to put in your name and email address. Submit it. You're going to have to verify it so they know you're not a bot or spam. And that's it. You can vote every day, once a day, until November 15th. Not only can you, but you should vote We really need your help. I mean, this is like, this is big time. If we win... It's just a testament to what learning can do and just reaching out to people and talking and all the hard work we've done. It would be fantastic. So we'd appreciate it. Now we're going to tell you a little bit more about today. As we alluded to, we are talking to a dog expert, but this is a real dog expert. He's not on TV trying to sell He's a show. not Caesar Milan. Yeah. This guy has dedicated his whole life to learning about animals, pets, dogs specifically. His name is Dr. James Serpell. And he was awesome. He is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the director at the Center for the Interaction of Animals and Society. We talked to him a little bit about what they do at the center. They work with... um, Guide dogs for the most part right now, just doing research around them. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. And the things he knows about these dogs because of his life's work are really interesting. Like I said, he's not really... He's not trying to sell you a book or anything. He does have a few. One of them, the domestic dog... It's evolution, behavior, and interactions with people. And he also has another one called In the Company of Animals. But those were things he wrote as an academic, you know, just to kind of share his knowledge with the world. In my opinion, that's what it came across like. Yeah, I mean, those books are 15, 20 years old, and now he's just, you know, working on a new revision of one of them. He's not on here to hawk books. He was on here to talk to us about dogs, which is perfect since we both have dogs. We love dogs. So... We'll turn it over to him here in a minute. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hope you're a dog lover. If not, you can pick up some cool things here and we'll catch you on the outro. We got some other interesting things. James, first, I want to jump into some things that you do. And I know you are the director at the Center for the Interaction of Animals and Society at uh, University of Pennsylvania, correct? 
That is correct, yes. Now, I wanted to know, because it sounds really interesting, what exactly do you guys do there? What's, what's kind of the work that you get done at that center? These days, most of it's actually um, a work on people and guide dogs, or at least uh, uh, working dogs. Um, so we, we're just actually concluding a, a study that's been looking at the reasons why guide dogs retire early, <laughs> which sounds like a, a, a funny sort of a question. But uh, it turns out that about 20% of guide dogs, despite doing really well in training and seeming to be um, you know, good dogs, w- once they get out into doing field work, actually working with blind people, they um, kind of lose their motivation. And it's a big problem for the organizations that breed and train these dogs. So um, we are collaborating with them and uh, trying to understand why some of these dogs kind of flunk and give up the ghost, so to speak, after usually one or two years of working. Because the expectation is most of these dogs will work for, you know, maybe eight years before they have to retire. And um, so they want to know why... um, some of these younger dogs aren't, aren't doing the job. That's so, I don't know, it's so specific. I wouldn't, you know, I never, I wouldn't have guessed that. But now that you mention it, I mean, somebody has to do this kind of research. So, <laughs> right, I mean, right? Well, we've been, doing a, we've been doing research with working dogs for a long, long time. We've worked with um, guide dogs, service dogs, even um, uh, search and rescue dogs, sniffer dogs. And um, I'm very interested in dog behavior. I've always been very interested in dog behavior. And so... Um, it's kind of naturally fallen into place that we've found ourselves doing this. The nice thing about this retirement study, early retirement study, is that we're really interacting a lot with the people, the blind people who use these dogs and, um, you know, sending them questionnaires and responding to their queries and things. So uh, it's very much looking at the relationship between the person and the dog and how that relationship may or may not predispose the dog to be successful or unsuccessful. And it's no, I don't even know what the word is. Everybody who listens to this show knows that John and I are big dog people. We both have dogs. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you, this is kind of a segue. Oftentimes I think, okay, my dog loves me because, you know, we have this bond and we're this pack and everything. And then when I look down at him, he's just looking at me like, when are you going to give me my next meal? And so (laughs) my question is, what is, for dogs, what is their motivation to be so loyal? And then it kind of leads into these service dogs. What is their motivation? I mean, do they enjoy the, the bonding or are they really just waiting for the next biscuit? Um, it's certainly more than waiting for the next biscuit. So the thing about dogs is that we have bred them to be, uh, in many ways, quite infantile. They're kind of Peter Pan type animals that never <laughs> fully grow up. And, um, of course... You know, young people are dependent on older people, their parents. And I think for dogs, we fulfill that role of a kind of extended parent. And they never really fully grow out of that. They always look to us, as it were, for, you know, parental security, parental guidance, that that type of thing. And, and they show this very much in their behavior, that constant looking at us, gazing at us, trying to anticipate what our next activity is going to be. I mean, certainly they're very uh, sensitive to what we're intending to do. In fact, they probably pick up on it faster than we do in a curious way. They have incredibly fast reaction times, reaction times that make us look kind of sluggish. And um, so sometimes it almost appears like they can read our minds. (laughs) What they're actually reading is our behavior, but they are reading it incredibly quickly. So they're anticipating what we're going to do. So they're anticipating that, you know, it's close to feeding time and the particular actions that we're performing may very likely lead to food or whatever, or very, may very well likely lead to going for a walk or getting in the car or something else that the dog really enjoys. Um, but they have this kind of uncanny ability to anticipate our thoughts almost because we give our thoughts away in our behavior. We think we're being um, opaque because we're opaque to other people, but in, to dogs who are so much more acute than other people, they can probably read us like a book. 
Yeah, it's amazing. I have one of the most clingy dogs ever. And I just noticed this the other day. And this, I mean, this is a perfect story for this is when I move a certain way at the computer at my desk, my dog instantly jumps off my bed and runs out the door because he knew I was getting ready to get up. And it might be completely different than the way that I usually move my mouse. But if I like move my arm to the armrest or whatever it may be, he recognizes that and jumps up. And it's almost like you said, he knows that I'm getting ready to get up before I realize that I'm ready to get up. Yeah, it's, it's quite uncanny. In fact, I got a, a phone call from a woman in uh, Philadelphia once who said, you know, you have to meet my dog because he, he, um, you know, he can read my mind. He can, uh, he can solve all kinds of complicated puzzles and things. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I went to their apartment. <laughs> it's this little Maltese terrier. And what she does, she puts like Scrabble letters on the ground or, or, or say in, in numbers written on pieces of cardboard. And she says, you know, what's six, pl uh, six plus three? And the dog will rush over and put its paw on the nine. Or what's, you know, six plus four? Oh, it'll put its paw on the ten. And, and she'll do all these different things. And, and at the end of it, she says, well, what do you think? And <laughs> you know, my response is, well, this dog is what they, you know, in the trade, we call it a clever hands, um, because clever hands was a famous performing horse at the turn of the century, sorry, turn of the last century, who, you know, baffled people because he pe appeared to be able to count. And he even baffled his own trainer because the trainer said he honestly didn't believe he was giving any cues to the horse to be able to solve the problems that were being set him. But it turns out that what was happening was the horse would tap his hoof on the ground a particular number of times, and it turned out that when he tapped his hoof enough times, the, the trainer just relaxed his posture slightly. Huh. And the horse picked up on that and knew when to stop tapping his hoof. And this, ho this dog was doing the same thing, but the owners had some really bizarre notions about how the dog was doing it. Because, <laughs> I mean... One of them, one of, I mean, when I really kind of said, well, what do you think's going on here? It turned out they thought the dog was the reincarnation of the woman's grandmother. Oh, God. I hope you <laughs> ran out of the house. <laughs> well, I didn't run out of the house. But I, I said, well, what, what makes you think that? And it turned out that both the dog and the grandmother had an unusual um, liking for steamed asparagus. And that clinched it as far as they were concerned. They thought wow. the dog must be the reincarnation of the grandmother. Case closed. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Now, have you guys done research around dogs and other animals, really, that are able to anticipate natural disasters? We had an earthquake in D.C. about a year ago, and about a minute before the earthquake, or when I could feel the earthquake, my dog sat there and was shaking, terrified, ran and hid, and just seemed to know that something was about to happen. What exactly are these animals picking up on that human beings aren't? I mean, do they just have such an increased sense of whether it's hearing or, or feeling? What exactly is it? I don't think we really know. I mean, I've heard some interesting stories. There was actually a study done up in British Columbia, I think, um, by a psychologist called Stanley Corrin. I don't think it's been published, or at least I haven't seen the results, but um, I, I sort of heard a preliminary report on it. And he was, he was just um, asking people to keep a diary on the, the activities of their dogs, you know, how, how their dogs were doing. He was analyzing all this data on activity levels, and he found sort of totally mysteriously that there was one particular day when all the dogs in his sample, which was scattered over the area of Vancouver, were suddenly less active, they kind of became inactive. He thought it was some weird statistical glitch or something, and he reanalyzed it and looked at it. And then somebody pointed out that that was the day that preceded an earthquake. Oh, so wow. it wasn't on the day of the earthquake. It was the day that preceded the earthquake. And, um, you know, he just put that out there as a sort of strange indication that, you know, somehow these animals were picking up on what was going to happen in, a, in the future. But I don't think anybody knows. There's all sorts of speculation that there may be... Um, you know, weird vibrations going on or le electrostatic charge. But the uh, truth is no one knows, but it's very, very commonly reported and not just among um, dogs, other animals as well. There was also that um, 
some very strange reports on the behavior of animals in relation to that uh, tidal wave incident that occurred in uh, the uh, sort of Asian Pacific region a few years back. Yeah, I remember hearing that. They ran to higher ground and things like that. There were stories of um, animals moving, you know, away from the coastline very rapidly in a very deliberate sort of way. And, you know, and people were standing around thinking, oh, what's up with all the animals? <laughs> This kind of also goes into, John and I were talking last night about how he saw this documentary about how much of human civilization and where we've gotten to can lend itself to our relationship with dogs specifically. Have you found through your research that we are extremely dependent on dogs as well? I mean, even specifically in Western culture, most people I know have grown up with dogs as part of the family. So... I mean, the dogs benefit from us and we benefit from them. Absolutely. And uh, it's a sort of continuing trend. So if you look at the trend in statistics of pet ownership, or especially dog and cat ownership, it basically uh, since the 1960s, which was the earliest date for which anyone was keeping um, you know, reasonable statistics, there's been a doubling of the dog and cat population every 20 years in the USA. So pet numbers are increasing. More and more people grow up with these animals. And I think this, this experience of growing up with these animals pretty much in the role of siblings in the family does have a profound impact on people's attitudes to animals in general. And, you know, we now have increasing evidence also that these relationships with um, pets, with companion animals, are non-trivial in the sense that it, they really seem to have an impact on people's health. Yeah, there's a lot of stories that I've read where people definitely, you know, thank their pets, whether it's cats, dogs, you know, whatever it is, for their ability to get over depression and anxiety and those type of ailments, especially depression. I mean, I know having a dog, it's really hard to be upset all the time because you're constantly looking at this animal that brings you joy and mm -hmm. is so, you know, such a loyal companion to you that I'd imagine it helps a lot of people curtail depression. Yeah. You know, I was reading an article just uh, just yesterday, actually, uh, where they did a study in a, a pain clinic. This is a, a clinic for people who suffer from chronic pain. And um, they, did, they just brought in a therapy dog to be in the waiting area of this clinic with these people. And they did comparisons of how they felt uh, um, various physiological measures as well at the same time and compared it with just sitting in the waiting area with, without a dog. And they found, you know, really quite substantial effects on these people's perception of their own pain. So their own pain diminished when the therapy animal was there, even if they didn't really even interact with it. Just having it in the room was enough. So, so these kinds of things are quite remarkable. What I wanted to ask you is I know that you've concentrated, especially in you know the one book that I, I definitely noticed, The Domestic Dog. You talk about just the domestic dog because studies have been done on wild dogs and kind of how we've bred them. But the domestic dog in particular, how different is that dog from the wolf or the wild dog? It's almost like a different species, really, because... Um, I mean, we domesticated the, wolf, the dog from the wolf. That's pretty clear cut. Um, so all of the evidence suggests that the ancestor of, the, of all of our domestic dogs was the wolf and that there wasn't any mixing with other wild canids. Um, so we know that they all came from wolves, but we also know that dogs are very different. And most of that difference is due to human selection for an animal that you know, fits well within human society. And, you know, we still have problems with dogs. Dogs don't fit perfectly in human society, but the fit's pretty good when you consider that they've only been domesticated for probably, you know, 15, 20,000 year maximum. So we have put tremendous selection pressure on these animals to adapt to us and to become uh, useful to us and to become uh, socially companionable to us. And uh, that has me meant that we've... Uh, selected against some of the kind of wolfish characteristics that don't fit very well and selected in favor of some of the wolfish characteristics that fit especially well. And also this being the selection for uh, what they call neoteny or infantilism, this uh, tendency to select for an animal that becomes sexually reproductive at 
a kind of mentally young age, if you know what I mean. So they can breed, but they still behave like puppies very much. You know, that's actually an interesting subject that I wouldn't have thought of, but I, I have to ask you now. We just fix or spay or neuter these these dogs, and it's so normal to us. You know, it's like, okay, it's going to happen. We're doing it for their health because of cancer reasons and all that. Have you done any research on to, I mean, it's kind of morbid when you think about it. Are we just saying, hey, this is how you're going to fit in our society because we can't have you going around humping things and, you know, reproducing like crazy and doing all that animal stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting payoff. Um, the health benefits of neutering at least male dogs are unclear. In fact, there may be more health disadvantages to male dogs. Wow. Uh, with female dogs, it's probably on balance better for their health to neuter them, to sterilize them. Behaviorally, you know, there's some evidence that sort of obnoxious male behaviors like humping or territorial marking or things like that mm -hmm. um, are probably reduced just because of um, the reduction in the hormone testosterone. But the evidence that neutered male dogs are less aggressive is very weak. Although most vets and uh, many people in the dog world will tell you that the best way to reduce aggression in a male dog is to neuter him. And um, actually, the science doesn't support that. So, yeah, I mean, what we do is we, we are kind of achieving a compromise here. We are concerned about uncontrolled breeding of dogs because not so long ago, there were stray dogs all over the United States back in the 1960s and 70s. Stray dogs were a common, a common problem, especially in urban areas. And, um, you know, indiscriminate breeding of dogs was thought to be the cause of that problem. And so there was, you know, very active campaigns to encourage uh, sterilization of pet dogs. But, you know, one of the downsides is that, you know, all these dogs can't breed. And some of those dogs might be exactly the kinds of dogs you'd want to breed because they have great personalities and their, you know, nice behavior and all kinds of characteristics that you would actually want to see perpetuated in the dog population. And instead, we have things like puppy mills producing dogs, which is far from ideal because those puppies are having a bizarre early childhoods, if you like. And also there's very little attention being given to, you know, who's mating with who and whether they have the right characteristics uh, in terms of being good pets. So it's a tricky one. Um, you know, I can certainly see that there's, there's an argument to be made for uh, encouraging people to neuter their dogs. But at the same time, there are other arguments that say, well, maybe we should give this a bit more thought. I guess I just took it for granted, but once you brought it up, I said, okay, I got to ask him. The other thing that I was wondering is when you talk about dogs, do they, I, I did want to know, do they look at us as kind of their pack or is it based on the breed or I'm trying to get in the mind of a dog through you, given all of your research, you know, this is the only time I'll be able to learn kind of the scientific research behind, you know, what you figured out. Well, there's a lot of mythology around the whole pack mentality thing in dogs. So there's a, a view that's been propagated oh, since the 19th century that the dog is simply a, a kind of tame wolf and that wolves live in these giant packs that go around um, eating buffalo and things. But the reality is that um, most wolf packs are family groups. So they are parents, sometimes grandparents, and offspring from several litters. And uh, every so often, some of these younger ones leave the, the family group and establish new family groups elsewhere. That is the pack as such. And um, so wolves and dogs like to be in families. Uh, and I, I prefer the term family than pack. Hmm. Pack also, the notion of the pack also perpetuates this idea of there being this kind of pack hierarchy with the... Uh, the dominant alpha individual who controls the activities of other members of the pack and asserts authority and discipline and provides leadership. And actually, uh, most people who've studied wolves in the wild uh, find that the situation is much more fluid than that. There are very few uh, overt demonstrations of dominance between pack members. 
it is clear that certain pack members kind of attract more respect <laughs> we should one could say than other pack members but uh, there's very little of the kind of um caesar milan type you know assert your dominance type of uh thing than you would think based on the literature that's out there on dog training and so forth where people continually resurrect this notion of you know how it's so important for you the human being to be the leader of the pack i think really your dog wants to regard you as the older parent or rather as the parent and your role as the parent is to be a um, a benevolent individual not a an assertive dominant individual now, most of the scientific research these days points uh, to evidence that actually dealing with your dog in that capacity as the kind of benevolent parent who rewards good behavior and uh, doesn't ov overtly punish bad behavior is much more productive in terms of getting what your, your dog to do what you want it to do than, than the kind of Caesar Milan approach. That's really, really interesting. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's just a great point. And then I was going to ask you, how long do dogs remember? Like if, if you hit your dog or you kind of spaz out because he runs in front of the road or, you know, like can you scar them from one event? Obviously, if you are, I don't, I don't know, tying them to a tree or whatever happens sometimes in really bad circumstances that affects them. But do they have this, you know, if, if you're a child and your dad punches you in the face once, you're going to remember that for your entire life. I'm wondering if dogs, do they have that same capacity or do they forgive easier? What your thought is behind that? They are very forgiving, but they do remember. Um, I think it probably varies a lot between individual dogs. So I've, you know, I've met dogs that, <laughs> you know, don't appear to have much in the way of a long-term memory. And I've got, met other dogs that <laughs> do. My dog. I mean, <laughs> my, 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 my own dog, just to give you an example, my own dog, um, you know, one year I took him for a walk somewhere and we, I met a snake. There was a snake at the base of a tree. And my dog got tremendously excited about this snake. Um, <laughs> and the snake went down a hole and disappeared. And my dog tried to dig it out of the hole. And I eventually dragged it away from the tree. And we didn't go back to that location for over a year. And then I took the dog for a walk in that same place. And when we were about 50 yards away from that tree, the dog took off and went, made a beeline straight for the hole under the tree where that snake had disappeared more than a year before. So it's an example of that, you know, one trial learning. He had that one very intense experience and he never forgot it. It, it just came instantly back. And, you know, I think that's true in terms of uh, traumatic experience as well. Um, where uh, these dogs that have had some unfortunate traumatic experience really never get over it. Uh, and um, they become very fearful, they become very anxious, and often the owner doesn't understand what's happened. They just think the dog's being stupid. <laughs> but you can't, rash, you can't rationalize with the dog. You can't explain to the dog, oh, I'm sorry, you know, that was an unfortunate incident that occurred, but it doesn't mean anything, because for the dog it did. You mentioned your dog, and that made me think of something. Given all of your research behind dogs, I'm wondering what kind of dog do you have? And then <laughs> when you're making that selection criteria, have you done any research behind what drives people to choose certain dogs? Like for some reason, I knew I wanted a big, short-haired, athletic, just I don't know. That's what I wanted. And it wasn't a conscious choice. It was just always there. So I was wondering if you had any take behind that. Not really. I mean, I, I didn't want a dog at all. I knew, <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to be too much, you know, I knew too much about dogs, but my, my kids finally um, insisted. And um, then we hummed and hawed about whether to go for a breed. And then I said, no, no, we should get a shelter dog. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, well, an adult shelter dog might be a bit of a lottery, especially, you know, with two young kids. So I said, well, let's try and get a puppy. So I contacted the local shelter and asked them whether they could let us know if they ever got any puppies in. And uh, actually it came back to me much quicker than I expected. It was sort of <laughs> within a week they came in and said, there's a litter of puppies coming in. So we went out there 
And actually, I had no say in the matter whatsoever. My, <laughs> my wife said, well, have that one. Right. You know, it's like a litter of 11 puppies there. And um, she just, for some reason, chose this one puppy. And he, he, you know, he's turned out to be an adorable fellow. You sure. know, he's a really nice dog um, with very few uh, obnoxious behaviors. He's got a few quirky things that he does. But uh, by and large, he's a splendid chap. Speaking of quirky behaviors, my dog... He's a, I want to say, pit bull, plot hound, boxer type mix. 40 pounds, but he always licks people in the mouth and nose. Do you have any idea yeah. <laughs> like what the reason behind this is and also how to curtail it? <laughs> I apologize for asking advice on my dog, but it's something that's persisted for three years. I've yet to be able to figure it out. Did you say he licks people on the nose? Yeah, yeah like he, right in the right for the mouth. He goes right for the mouth, so he'll try to yeah. li lick in an open mouth or in your nostrils. Well, that's a absolutely natural dog behavior, and actually, it's the behavior that puppies show towards their parents. Huh. And um, it's designed to trigger the parent to regurgitate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, Perfect. I'm uh, I'm not suggesting that you sh you or anyone else should regurgitate. Um, in fact, that might be too reinforcing. But it's very common in dogs. In puppies, it triggers regurgitation. In adult dogs, it's a way that usually junior members of the family show kind of respectful behavior towards their elders. So they will rush up to an older uh, animal and lick around the mouth. At that point, it's not necessary for the elder to regurgitate anymore. It's just a kind of, it's a token sign that the the junior animal is showing respect for the older one. Yeah, you know, and, and I, I see that all the time when he's playing with other dogs in the neighborhood. He will run at a dog and do that, or when they're done playing, he'll just sneak up, lick the mouth, and walk away. Yeah, and it's a, a very, very normal, natural behavior. It's kind of disconcerting, you know, to people who don't particularly want to be licked in the face. Sure. Um, and you, you can discourage it. It's a very easy thing to um, train a dog not to do. Basically, well, it would kind of take a while to explain, and, but most training books will, you, you know, tell you how to discourage a dog from jumping up. Um, that's uh, what it's normally referred to as just jumping up. Mm -hmm. I'll take a look what into that then. <laughs> what they're actually doing is jumping up, trying to get to lick your face because oh. that's what they think they ought to do. But you can, it, you can easily discourage it. That's really interesting advice. And I know we're running short on time here. And a lot of times we ask this question at the beginning, but I want to jump right in. But... We base a lot of this podcast around kind of doing what you enjoy, following your passion, and I'm really interested in how you kind of got into this, how you came to, to find, I mean, were you always passionate about animals or dogs? What were you wondering? And then did you just say, I'm going to learn everything there is and just become an expert on the subject? Kind of, what was your path a little bit? Well, I'd like to say that my path was very sort of directional in that sense, but unfortunately it wasn't. I, I, I What happened was that... Um, in answer to your question, was I always passionate about animals? The answer is yes. So even from earliest childhood, to the extent that my parents considered taking me to a, you know, a kind of psychiatrist, I was so passionate about animals, they thought it was abnormal. When I went to university, I did a zoology degree, which seemed like a kind of appropriate thing to do for someone who was passionate about animals. But I did it at a university that was uh, had a wonderful array of courses that you could you know, incorporate into your degree. And one of those courses was a course at a place called the Institute of, Ant of Archaeology in London. It was a course on the domestication of animals and plants, on the sort of origins of agriculture, if you like. So I went and did that course, and I became completely entranced with the whole topic. And then there was an opportunity to do a sort of independent study. So I decided to do an independent study on the domestication of the dog. Uh, because it seemed so intriguing to me. And um, that's really where it started. And, and when I finished my first degree, I thought, you know, I really want to do more of this. So I, I applied to the University of Cambridge in England to work with some people there on human-dog relationships. And I was lucky enough to convince a pet food company to give me some money to <laughs> do that. And um, and sort of the rest is history, really. It just it just developed from there. That's interesting. So you knew your passion and you just went for it. That's really fantastic. Well, you know, again, thanks so much for being on the show. I know that, as I mentioned, 
the the two books that I found and, and the one that we've kind of talked a lot about, The Domestic Dog, its evolution, behavior, and interactions with people. I also saw um, in the company of animals a study of human animal relationships. And those books kind of are all about the research you do. Is there anywhere else you, you'd like to guide our listeners or make them aware of? Because many of them are pet lovers, dog owners, you know, everything like that. So I know they're they're happy to hear this in the first place. Well, I'm working on a new edition of The Domestic Dog. It's it's now like 15, more than 15 years old. And so it really needs revising. So I'm I've actually, um, I'm in the middle of editing a new edition of that book. In the Company of Animals holds a sort of special place in my life because it was really my first major kind of scholarly output. And um, it's been through one new edition, but it hasn't been revised since 1996 now. So it's amazingly, it's still in print. (laughs) And if, in fact, it's, it's, it's experienced a new lease of life because now in the United States there are quite a lot of small and large colleges offering courses on human-animal interactions. And that book has suddenly become a course book. It's suddenly become a textbook, which I never anticipated when I wrote it. So it's, it's, uh, it's funny. It's, it's been um, resurrected. I was going to say, I mean, that just means you did a good job the first time, right? <laughs> I guess so, but... Probably the pa- publishers are going to come and badger me for another edition. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, that's going to be your next project. Probably. Well, again, I mean, thank you so much. Well, I enjoyed talking to you both. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have bye. a great night. Welcome back. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. If you've been over to the website recently, you've probably noticed that we have... Big changes a new logo, we've got new colors going on, new design, all that stuff. And we have one person specifically to thank, and his name is Shane Weaver of ESW Design. He did all of the design work, the logo, the banner, all that cool stuff. We're actually gonna interview him and talk to him about starting a small business and all that cool stuff. So a big shout out to Shane, thank you. And if you guys need any work, check him out, eswdesign.com. And let us know what you think about the new look. I mean, uh, it's it's pretty cool. It's definitely a little more identifiable, if you will. You can see it a little clear, more clearly. So I'm interested to hear what you guys think about that. John and I are back. We got a whole slate of interviews lined up, some really cool ones. So uh, we should be back in action on a weekly basis. And don't forget, we got the holidays coming up. I know you're buying your presents on Amazon. We have seen a heavy decline in Amazon purchases, except for our friends and family. So thanks for that. But so head on over to smartpeoplepodcast.com and there's our Amazon link. There's also a tab where you can get the link and use that for your Amazon purchases. Yeah. If you've got ad block on, check out the Amazon tab and then you can see a picture there and click over to our affiliation account. But otherwise, click the link at the top of the page. Use that every time that you buy Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever holiday you're celebrating this winter. I was trying to think of other ones. Couldn't think of anything (laughs) else. That's okay. But, you know, we get a little piece from Amazon on all the orders that you make. You know, nothing comes out of your pocket, comes out of theirs. They appreciate us doing marketing. We appreciate you guys buying through our link. Yeah, so if you like what we do, help support us a little bit. If not, why are you still listening? Don't go anywhere. Keep downloading. That's a good question, right? If you hate us, just keep (laughs) downloading it. But, you know, as soon as it gets on your iPhone or your computer, just delete it. Shameless. That's fine. So anyways, guys, thanks again for tuning in. Make sure you listen on a weekly basis. Like I said, awesome interviews coming up. We'll be Vote for soon. us. Podcastawards.com. Yeah.